Oh, come on. I walked in, the, came down the stairs a while ago, and the first thing I saw on the sign out there was breakfast and wrap-up. That's got to give somebody some, some excitement here. So one more time, good morning. good morning. Thank you, I appreciate that. Let me say to you that I am exceptionally excited about being here, and you're going to know why in just a minute. First of all, you just now heard from your incoming and now duly inducted president that I am a full time professional speaker, trainer, author, etc. That is absolutely true. I've been doing it for almost 36 years now. However, today is a unique environment, a unique situation for me, and I need to explain to you why before we get into our content. First of all, I live in Kentucky. In fact, about 210 miles further west from here, many of you know Caldwell County. In fact, I have uh, a number of my friends and even classmates in the room today, as well as my magistrate, my judge, and others are in the room today. So I'm presenting to friends. Trust me, I will hear at Kay's Kitchen or at Heaton's Barbecue or someplace next week or the next coming week. I'm going to hear about this presentation today. I guarantee you that. No, no, that's special. Number two, the fact that I travel all over the country and back all over the world to do the presentation to be able to get in my car and drive 210 miles. And when I finish here this morning, in fact, I'm going to be able to go to Berea, Kentucky, and to attend a, a retirement lunch with someone I used to work with 40 some odd years ago in Berea, Kentucky. Now that's unusual for me. I don't have the opportunity to do it, but it gets even deeper. Keiko. This organization, I, I spoke here before. How many of you show show hands to remember me speaking here before? Exactly, because it was 34 years ago. 34 years ago, I had just started as a professional speaker. My mother was the county clerk of Conway County. She pulled some strings. Y'all felt sorry for me. Here I am. I didn't look like well, that picture is gone now. But I didn't look like that picture a few minutes ago, 34 years ago. And then the other thing, of course, that I'm here to talk to you about is this whole concept of sharing from a county standpoint. My mother was a county clerk for four, for four terms. My sister was a county judge executive for one term a few years ago. And so it's not like I'm standing in front of a, a bunch of strangers, even though I may not have met that here before. My job is not to be here this morning to talk to you about me. My job is to talk to you about you. Specifically about your role as leaders in Oldham County and Scott County and, and Pike County and Cobble County and Lyon County and wherever else in between 120 counties are. Because I've realized that not only are some of you elected officials and some of you appointed officials and some of you hired for particular positions, all of you occupy a position of leadership and multiple positions of leadership in most cases in the communities that you represent, the counties that you represent. So again, my job today in the next few minutes that I have to, to share with you is to talk to you about you. And about specifically your role as leaders going forward. Now, you can do that in a number of different ways. I had the opportunity a few minutes ago, I was talking to some folks from over on the eastern side of the state, and they asked me, now, do you do training? I go, yeah, I do speaking, training, I do a lot of things, all in the area of leadership. And it's from that training standpoint, I want to share with you what we're going to begin with this morning. Several years ago, Again, I've been doing this 35 years, full time. Several years ago, I decided I need to have a definition of leadership that I, Bill Vanderson, can hang my hat on. Now, if you Google the term leadership definition, I promise you, you can even test me on this for later if you like, I promise you, you'll come up with hundreds if not thousands of definitions of leadership. So mine is one definition, but I want you to hear this definition. Because it sets the tone for everything else I'm going to talk about today. Before I tell you what my definition of leadership is, let me tell you what my definition of leadership is not. Anybody, at least on 
the churches be somewhat troublesome for some in the record. First and foremost, leadership from my perspective is not position. Yes, I realize that we have people in lot lofty and elected positions in this room, many of you. And I realize that other positions, as I said, have been hired or appointed, you're all in a position of responsibility. You wouldn't be here for this conference if that were not so. You've been hired because people expect certain things from you. But listen carefully. A position does not indicate that you're a leader. A leader is not indicated by position. A leader is indicated by what you do with and in and for that position. And so the rest of the definition becomes even more important, I think, when we start talking about this this morning. Leadership is not position. Leadership is two things. Two things. Number one, the ability to offer service. And number two, the willingness to take action. Now, let, me, let me focus on those two for a second. The ability to offer service and, not or, and the willingness to take action. Service. If I came to you, I wrote a book on service several years ago on customer service. If I came to you, almost any table in this room, I said, hey, give me a definition of service. I promise you, almost universally, everybody at your table would say, well, service is in one way or another, maybe getting and exceeding expectations of your customers, your clients, your, your whoever. Here's my next question that I ask from audiences. Okay, now that you have the single best leader in mind that you've ever worked with or ever been around, ask yourself the second question. What was it about him or her that makes him so effective as a leader? In your opinion, there is no wrong answer because this is you making the decision for yourself what was it, what characteristics did they employ that made them so effective as a leader? Well, let's hit the pause button for just a second. If you start to understand why I ask this question, if we ask enough people, broad-based people, not just people from Kentucky, people from every state, not just people in local government, people in manufacturing, people in education, people in wherever, if you ask the question and you start getting common answers, then we start to realize there's universal issues at play here. Does that make sense? And so again, I ask the question, think of the best leader you've ever known, most of us can come up with one, think about the characteristics he or she employed, write them down. And then I spend quite a bit of time in a training program figuring out what those characteristics are. Now this is where I'm going to cut from the table. Over the course of those 400 experiences, with literally tens of thousands of people that have gone through my training program, I've come up with more than 275 characteristics of leadership. 275. Now, if you're listening carefully to this, you're thinking right now, holy cow, there's no way I could learn or practice 275 characteristics of leadership, to which I would absolutely agree. You can't, I can't, nobody can do that. It's too much. So, Phil, it's a waste of effort. No, I didn't say all of them were equal. I said there were 275 total that I've collected that I intend to write a book on one of these days when I have the time to get to it. But embedded in those 275 characteristics of leadership are seven that make at least 90% of the list. And again, I don't care what the audience is. I don't care how old they are. I don't care if it's male or female. I don't care what part of the country they're in. Seven characteristics make the list every time, 90, 95% of the time. And three of the seven characteristics make at least 95% of the list or better. One of the characteristics makes 99% of the list. Now, I hope you're thinking, I hope you tell us what some of these are. Unfortunately, I don't have time to tell you the seven. I just don't have time this morning, but I do have time to tell you the top three, and I do have time to tell you the top four. So if you're interested, you may not even need to write these down, because some of these, you're going to go, oh, that's just a no-brainer. Of course I would have expected that. That makes perfect sense to me. But let me ask you a second question. Just because it's a 
no-brainer makes perfect sense to you. The question is, are you using this knowledge to the greatest level possible for your role as a leader in the courthouse or in your community or in your church or on the school board or whatever other roles that you may play in your respective community? I'm going to start with number three. I'm going to build some suspense, if you will, or at least hope to. I'm going to start with number three, then go to number two, and now I'm going to finish with the number one as the first and foremost characteristic of leadership. And I'm going to get you to think about them as they relate to you individually, and of course as they relate to you and your role as leaders in your organization. Here's the third one. I wish I had time to tell you more, but the third on this list of the top three, the third characteristic that audiences say again and again and again is I want my leader to be caring and compassionate. I'll let that sink in for just a second. What does that mean to you? Well, I do care about my neighbors, my friends, my constituents. You may, but how would they know? How would they know that you have a level of care and compassion for them other than you volunteered your time, you sacrificed your own, what? You wanted to do that, in their opinion. And the question is, why and how can they seek care and compassion? Well, certainly over the last couple of years, we haven't had a problem in Kentucky looking for opportunities to be caring and compassion. December of two years ago, or almost two years ago now, certainly a tornado swept through the western end of the state, and many of us saw the care and compassion, not only the local officials and elected officials, but our neighbors the outpouring of love, but not only our neighbors, but, but friends from all over the country. And then just a few months later, then we saw the, the devastating flooding in eastern Kentucky. And there's other tragedies and other circumstances on a more local level where care and compassion rise to the forefront almost immediately, whenever there's a disaster. Let me ask you another question. All of us, all of us today are hoping, even praying, if we are praying people, that those kind of disasters avoid us. We don't want them to hit anybody, but we certainly don't want them to hit us and, and impact us. We're praying that those days are behind us. We're praying that we have more, <laughs> that we have that more safe and secure experience. But that does not mean that care and compassion, therefore, is put on hold until the next disaster. There are opportunities every day in your community for you to show care and compassion for individuals that are going through individual circumstances. Some of them are devastating, some of them are personally trying, they can be deaths or injuries or, or illnesses or whatever, but some of them are just an opportunity to step in and say, I care about you. I mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, I live in Princeton. I am originally from Princeton, but there's a, a gap of about a quarter of a century, about 25 years, but after I graduated from Murray State University and I moved to Berea and then I moved to Missouri and then I moved to Florida, raised my family for a while until about 20 years ago I decided to come back. That 25 years I was gone. It was during that time that I started this business. Now remember, I, I travel about uh, a little bit less now than it used to be, but I still travel probably 50 or 60 percent of my time. That's my job. Okay, and so I'm always going to or from some some engagement. At this particular point that I share this story, I was living in Ocala, Florida. That's where we started this business. And interestingly enough, coincidentally enough, I booked a program in central Kentucky, specifically Jamestown, Kentucky. I don't know who is right here from Jamestown, but, but I was going down there to the state park to speak to a group. And I was going to speak in the evening, so I do something I normally don't do. I decided to fly up that morning from Orlando. Because I had plenty of time, I'll take the flight, I'll drive down to Jamestown for the evening program, everything will be great. Well, I flew into Louisville, no problem. I landed in Louisville, I walk up to the, to the Avis desk, as I had done literally over 500 times in my career. I already knew the drill, I already had my, my bill pulled out, I already had my driver's license, I already had my credit card. The, the guy even made a comment, oh, you've done this before. I go, yeah. He looked at it, he takes it, he goes, thank you, Mr. Manning, for your business. I said, sure, no problem. He said, let me get your card. First of all, he looked at my credit card, swiped the credit card, no problem. Then he looked at my driver's license. And I'll never forget the expression on his face changed. He looked at my driver's license. 
And he looked up and hey, wasn't smiling, wasn't happy anymore. Then he looked back at my driver's license. Then he looked up to me and then he delivered the bad news. He said, Mr. Manning, I'm sorry, but we can't rent you a car. And immediately panic struck. What? I've got this thing to get to. You know, I've got this engagement. And I'm, what? He said, I'm sorry, Mr. Manning, but and he showed me, your license has expired. I went, oh man. I knew it was coming up, but it slipped up on me. I traveled a lot. And immediately, an involuntary response. I'm looking at this Avis gate right in front, and I immediately looked back down where there was Enterprise and Budget and Hertz, and he went, and they ain't going to one either. <laughs> he said, I'm sorry, Mr. Manager, but if we went into a car, we would lose our job. I don't want to lose your job, but I'm in a dilemma. I'm like, oh, man. All right, thank you. Now, I'm no different than you. Now, this was 20 plus years ago, before we were all carrying around a cell phone and mobile phone with us all the time. But I'm no different than you. I'm trying to think, who do I know in Louisville that can help me? Who has the capacity to offer service and take action at this moment in time for me? I could call my friends and family from Princeton. From Princeton, that's three plus hours away. I had to do it on local level. And immediately I thought of Rob. My old buddy Rob. Rob was and I went to Murray State together. We were a big buddy. We had a great time together. We were good friends. We were great friends. Now, never mind that we haven't talked in about 13 years. How many of y'all have friends like that? We were great friends. We didn't get mad at one another or anything. We just kind of, he went his way, I went my way. and. We kind of lost track of each other. But immediately I think of Rob. Yeah, Rob will help me. I'm sure Rob will help me. So I rushed over to, do you remember the bank of telephones that they used to have in the airport? And the big, the big uh, uh, phone books? And I mean, to start thumbing through phone books. And there was his name. Lived in Fairdale, Kentucky. And I called him up. Got the number.
Rob pitches me the keys to his truck. He said, there it is. He said, the registration is in the glove compartment. If they pull you over, tell them where you want. I'll back you up, brother. <laughs> and with that, the two of them get in the car, and they pull, or, you know, are getting ready to pull away. And I get in the truck because I'm thinking, Jamestown, Kentucky now. And then as I pull up beside him, I realize we haven't even figured out tomorrow. So I roll down the window, and I go, hey, when I get back into town tomorrow, dinner's on me. They gave me the thumbs up. I laughed all the way to Jamestown. Yes, I was an illegal driver for a few minutes, but I was laughing about friends. I was laughing about how things turn out for the good. I, of course, tell Jamestown clients that story. They got a kick out of it. I drive back, drive back the next day, and we're having dinner as promised with Ruth and Rob, and we're all laughing. It's all over now. It's all good. And then Rob says, oh, man, I almost forgot. Forgot what? I almost forgot to tell you what happened today. Well, what happened today? He said, well, Ruth dropped me off at school. He was a school teacher. Ruth dropped me off at school this morning. He said, but she couldn't pick me up because she had a meeting this afternoon. So I forgot. I forgot. I didn't have a ride until almost school was over. And I went into the teacher's lounge and I go, hey, anybody got it? Going my way, I need a ride. And you all know when you work with people so close, you get to know people not only who they are, but they know their family, their friends, their circumstances. <laughs> he said, the other folks in the, in, the, uh, in the lounge said, well, Rob, is your car broke down? No, 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 I loaned it to a friend. They even know your friend. Oh, did you loan, loan, loan it to Tony or to Wes? No, 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 this is a friend you don't know. Phil. Phil? Yeah, he's a friend from college. Hasn't been in 15 years. Rob? You loan your car to somebody from college you haven't seen in 15 years? Yeah, yeah. Why? He doesn't have a license. <laughs> Rob, you loan your car to somebody from college that you haven't seen for 15 years and he doesn't have a license? Yeah, yeah. Where did he take it? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't even ask him where he took it. I have no idea. Rob, let me get this straight. You load your car to someone you haven't seen in 15 years who, who doesn't have a license and you have no clue where he took your car. Is that about it? And Rob said, yes. Yeah. Then she asked the logical question, which is what? Rob, why would you do that? To which Rob responds, he's my friend. Caring compassion can show itself at the worst of times. When the winds blow and the rain fall, when big ice storms hit. But caring compassion is still alive, or should be, in those times that are not so terrible, but that are still personally challenging for everybody. An opportunity for you to show the caring compassion that you are more than just in search of their votes. <coughs> But you have an opportunity to help them when you can because of who you are in the position and opportunity. Number three on this list of characteristics of great leadership is care and compassion. But then we move to number two. Now remember, this is not one or two or three people. These are thousands of people reinforcing the concept that these characteristics matter. And the number two on the list the ability to listen and connect. Now, if I came to most of you and I said to you, are you a good listener? Many of you would respond, because we've been conditioned to respond this way. Many of you would respond, yeah, I'm a pretty good communicator. That's not what I asked. I didn't ask if you were a good communicator. Certainly listening is a part of communication, a very important part of communication. But listening also is a standalone. Because if you're listening, you have the opportunity to learn something. I can't, I can't tell you, I've cut my eyes two or three times over this table, the Lyon County, the Caldwell County, because instead of before, I've got friends sitting over there. I've got friends in other places in the room, but there's a lot of people that know me a lot longer and a lot better than any of you will know me. And one of the things they know that I can't hide from, some of y'all are thinking, well, he's a talker, ain't he? Well, they know 
was not just started in the last few days, weeks, months, or years. I've been a talker my entire life. In fact, I remember one time when I was about five or six years old, no older than six for sure, that I was down at my grandmother's house. Now, some of you, maybe many of you in this room will be able to relate to the story. My grandmother, Mackie Manders, my dad's mother, was the consummate country grandmother. My grandmother, no exaggeration, cooked on a wood stove until the day she died, and she died in 1974. By the way, she never had running water. In her entire life, she never had running water. And again, she died in 1974. I never, never, not one time did I ever see my grandmother in anything other than a skirt or a, a plain cotton dress. Certainly not pants. A bathing suit? A grandmother in a bathing suit? Are you kidding me? My grandma, oh, she always had her hair up in a, in a net, right? She always wore, always wore an apron. And the apron always had two pockets. And in this pocket, she always had a handkerchief. I mean, I never remember her without a handkerchief. She believed you could conquer the world with a handkerchief. And in this pocket, a little snuff, okay? <laughs> yeah, my grandmother dipped a little snuff. It was one day that I was with my grandmother. I was in her old kitchen, and she was doing what I love best. She was cooking, baking specifically. And she was making biscuits. Now, this was not unusual. She made biscuits almost every day of her life. But she was rolling them out, and she had the flour, and she was wiping her hands on her apron. She had flour on her. And I just thought this was cool thing. It was just me and her. Well, there were a few times when I was the only grandkid around. And man, I made use of it. I was talking. Every step she took, I'd ride on her heels, talking to her, talking to her. Man, she'd turn around, she'd bump into me, she'd work away, I just kept talking. I don't know how long that lasted, it seemed to be 20 or 30 minutes, but eventually my grandmother had had enough, and she turned her attention to me. She wiped her hands on, on that apron, she leaned over, she said, son, come here, come here. I thought, oh, this is great, now I have her undivided attention, I can keep talking. Right? And so I come over and I look up at her and she puts her hands on my shoulders. Now, I don't know if you've been around old people in a while, but old people sometimes need someone to steady themselves, to, to sort of position themselves with. And, and that's what I thought was happening. I, and I felt her take hold of my shoulders, but then I felt pressure starting down on my shoulders. And then I realized, wait a minute, she's getting down. And she went down to her old raggedy knee, still holding on to my shoulders, but this time it's very different. This time we're looking square into each other's eyes. Now, I don't know that it hadn't happened, but I don't ever remember it having happened before, that he and she and I were on the same level, looking at one another. And I remember thinking, this is special. I, I need to hang on to this. I need to cling to this memory. And I had, wasn't too hard, actually, when when I heard her say what she said to me, she's holding my, my shoulder, she's looking deep in my eyes, and she said, and I quote, Shut up! <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I actually recoiled. I tried to run backwards, but it was, you know, it was impossible. She just, she just climbed down, and not only climbed down, but she pulled me closer, and, and she wrapped her arms around me so tightly that, believe this or not, I can still, in my mind's eye, feel the compression, even today. And when she had me totally immobile, she said these words to me. She said, son, don't you realize that when you're talking, you never learn anything. It's only if you're willing to shut up and listen because my might just work something. Now, I don't know about y'all. I'm not a young man anymore. In fact, they, some of them say I'm an old man. Certainly getting closer to that than I've ever been before. But I will tell you the wisdom in my grandmother's words has become very real to me. In fact, in my years of business, corporate, working with organizations around the world. I've had lots of high-level conversations, lots of high-level conversations. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard that first voice in the back of my head saying, I'd like to wrap my arms around you and pull you and you and you and you and you, and you 
goes to my chest and whisper that same lesson in your ear. Don't you realize that if you can listen, you might just learn something. They may not be the elected official. They may not be the expert on a particular subject, but that does not mean they don't have something that you can learn if you're willing to listen. That's what lead followers want from their leaders. They want someone that will care and be concerned and compassionate about them. But they also want someone, even more so, that will listen to them. But then the third thing, the third thing that they want, and make no mistake about this, I hope you remember what I said earlier. Over 99% have claimed this third thing. No other character, no other character. In, in fact, I'll even go one step further. Believe it or not, I'm very anal. I measure everything. I track everything. I always have. It's just the nature of who I am and how I do my business. And of those 400 plus times that I've done this exercise and asked that same question, best leaders ever known and characteristics of leadership, only nine times out of 400 plus, you can do the math for yourself. Only nine times has this next characteristic not made the list. No other, not the care and compassion, not the listening, none of it that many times, only nine times. And in the nine times that it did not make the list, interestingly enough, people would say, yeah, they didn't even argue with me. Yeah, it's on the list. Why don't you see it? And then they quote another word, so I'm going to give you both of these words. Because they do fit together. The number one characteristic, the number one characteristic of leadership, at least in my straw poll that I've done over the last 25 years, the number one characteristic of leadership, honesty. Honesty. Those nine times, by the way, that honesty didn't make the list and they argued with me that it did, you know the word that was there? Integrity. Because some people They're first cousins, they're closely related for sure, but they're not the same thing. Because if they were the same thing, we would need two different words. Honesty is about being honest, being truthful. Integrity is about doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Not because it's easy or quick or even politically expedient, but because it's the right thing to do. Now you put those two together, being honest and integrity based, that's a good combination. If I came to you, if I walk around, and I came up to you, now, I'm not going to do this, I'm not so bold as to do this, but if I walked up to you right now, looked at any one of you in the eye, and said, Adam, ah, are you a liar? Most of y'all, especially if you didn't know me, and even if you didn't know me, maybe quicker, most of y'all would get upset pretty quick. Who do you think you are calling me a liar? You don't even know me, you just walked up. Or if I ask this question instead, hey, you think about lying to somebody today? What is it? You mean not only you're calling me a liar, but you're calling me a premeditated liar? I'm planning it? Guess what? I've been the same way. Would be even today, too, if you walked up to me and asked me if I'm a liar or if I'm thinking about lying. But unfortunately, I am, or at least was. 45 miles south of here, is a manufacturing facility that I cut my teeth in. My first job out of college. They put me in a pretty responsible position. Most of the stories I like to tell, I like to tell stories because I think you can learn a lot of things from a story. I think you can really retain the lesson for a long time. But this story I don't like to tell, and you'll know why in just a moment. I was in a pretty responsible position, an HR position, human resources position, with this manufacturing facility. The facility had about 400 employees, and interestingly enough, about the same number of people that are in this room right now. I was the HR guy, I was the one that government went to, I was in charge of hiring and firing and promotions and demotions and all the things that had to do with employee decisions. And I'm sitting in my office, probably at that time, about maybe 25 years old, 24, 5, 6, something like that. Sitting in my office one day, and all of a sudden I hear a knock on the door. I look up, and there's a young man, he's about the same age as me at that time. And he was immediately apologetic. Oh, 
Phil, I am so sorry, so sorry to interrupt. No, no, come on in. Sit down. No, 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 I'm not going to sit down. You're obviously busy. I just have a quick question to ask you. Do you mind if I ask you this question? I don't mind. What's, what's your question? Here's the question. Phil, have y'all made a decision on that scheduler's position yet? Now, let me caution you. Don't get hung up or caught up on this schedule. Don't worry about that at all. But instead, understand the question he's asking. In my job as HR manager, we would post jobs, job openings, and we would give them the opportunity to know what jobs were available throughout the plant. So I would post them in a public place. If people were interested, they could sign the posting, and we would promise them an interview. We would not promise them the job. We would not even promise them we'd fill the job internally. But any employee that wanted to be considered for any job would at least get an interview. We felt that only fair. And so, about three weeks earlier, I post a job, a scheduled position. A number of people, not just this individual, but a number of people had signed a posting, and in fact, we had already pulled the posting down and had completed all the interviews for everybody that had signed the list. So, his question is very logical. Phil, have you all made a decision on that scheduled position yet? Now listen carefully. The honest answer to his question was, yes we have, you ain't in. But is that what I said? Is that what I said? All of a sudden, in that moment of what I would have considered innocence, I heard myself answer his question this way. Uh, uh, no, we haven't made the decision yet. Pause. Without him saying another word, I had then added, we expect to make the decision in the next couple of weeks, an even briefer pause, and then I added, and of course when we do make the decision, you'll be what? The first one. I saw this gentleman just now who what for many of you are either thinking of it is if I wasn't okay. This way said, look at me, come on. That's right. If you walked up to me that day when I walked into work and said, You a liar? I was, what? You planning to lie to somebody today? And yet, not only am I a liar, I'm a three-time liar. Have y'all noticed the time when you tell that first lie, the second, third, and all that follow gets pretty easy after that? You know what this young man did that morning? He looked at me, he went, thank you, Phil. Oh, thank you, look, I'm just getting a little impatient, but look, if everybody else can wait, I can wait too, thank you. So he came over and shook my hand, and then left the front. Now I wish, <laughs> I wish I could tell you that as soon as he left my office, I was immediately wracked with guilt, guilt and remorse. I wish. I can tell you that. That's not what I remember happening at all. I just went back to work. I don't even know that I gave it any more thought. I hope I did, but I certainly don't remember <laughs> doing it. I just went back to work. Now, I don't know if you believe in karma or coincidence or just desserts. I don't know what you believe. I believe that things happen for a reason. And on that particular day, no exaggeration, we had scheduled a quarterly plant-wide meeting. It's once a quarter, four times a year, we bring all 400 employees in a big room like this, no table, just chairs, and we give them a safety union address. Here's what's going on in the business, here's what the sales look like, here's what the safety record looks like, here's what the schedule looks like, yeah, we just give them a safety union address. In that meeting, there would always be 400 people sitting down hearing the same thing at the same time and two people standing up. Obviously, our plant manager would be on a riser, standing here, and he would be the one that would lead the meeting. But I was always over here. I was always the second person standing over here by a door that led out of the room because I was the gopher. The plant manager, hey, Phil, go check on him. Phil, go call. Phil, go look. And I just found it was easier to stand up and get in and out without causing a lot of confusion. So get the picture in your mind, 400 people sitting in the room, all chairs, two people standing up. The plant manager gets up and starts his presentation, he does everything we heard. here's the sales, here's the safety, he went through all the predictable things, things we heard every quarter, and then he did what we also 
plan and prepared for it every quarter. He looked at the offense and he said, look, we've got about five minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Immediately, hand shot. Right there on the front row, over to his right. He said, yes, what's your question? He said, y'all have, have y'all made a decision on that scheduling position yet? It wasn't the guy that I talked to earlier in the day. It wasn't. He was out deeper into the audience someplace, and when he heard that one of his colleagues asked the question, he's even nudging the guy next to him. I don't know the answer to this, but I talked to Phil just this morning. They haven't made a decision. They expect to make it in the next three weeks, and I'm going to be the first to know. So can you imagine? Can you even imagine how I felt when all of a sudden this question was asked and I heard my plant manager answer the question this way. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have made a decision about that scheduling position. We made it about two weeks ago. And then he looks at me and he says, Phil, I don't see any reason for us not to go ahead and announce it now to you. 398 people in the room had no clue what was going on at that point. Two of us knew exactly. By the way, you think I found his eyes? Everybody else is looking forward, not him. He's looking over at me. I'm looking at him. Those eyes were like spotlights. And by the way, do you believe eyes can speak? Yes or no? His eyes are speaking to me. And I need to speak to him. And so literally five minutes later, me and Tucker, nobody had a clue what was going on except the two of us. And I knew what I had to do, and so I'm like a salmon swimming upstream. I've got to fix this. I've got to, I've got to try to build a rebuild, a rebuild men this fence. And I get up to him. I never forget this. He's about six foot three. I'm about five nine. I'm literally looking up at him. He's looking down at me. I think that's kind of ironic. But anyway, I'm looking up at him. He's got his, uh, and he's looking down at me. He's got his arms crossed like this. And I start apologizing. Oh man, you got to you got to understand you caught me at a bad time this morning. I mean, you caught me off guard. I wasn't at liberty to share. And, and I'm just sort of spewing. He never said a word. Not one word. But he also never broke his gaze. He just continued to look at me. I don't know how long I went on. It sounded like I just was going on and on and on, but eventually I had to come up for air and I hadn't. I had anything else to say unless I just started repeating myself. And so I just kind of finished with, man, I, I am so sorry. I hope you forgive me. Without saying a word, his arms that were crossed, now uncrossed, and he turned and he pivoted, and he took about two steps, maybe a step and a half. He pivoted, he took about a step, and then he paused, and he never even turned completely around. He looked at me, and he said this one word that haunts me still. What if? Thus rendering me completely unnecessary. For someone who had designs and a desire to be an effective leader in my career, it ended right there for me. Yeah, we ended up working for another two years together. But as you can imagine, the relationship was never the same. Certainly was not built on trust from his part toward me. And even though I tried to rebuild the relationship, it never was as strong as it was before. And by the way, I want to stress something. This was a self-inflicted wound. He did nothing wrong. He asked a question. I could have just as easily said, I'm sorry, I really can't. I really am not in a position. I can't divulge that information. Even though I know I'm, I'm not at liberty to share it right now. Oh yeah, he would have tried to wiggle it out of me. You know how that is. You get it every day. But at least he would have said at some point down the road, you know what? As much as Phil aggravates me sometimes, he won't tell me what I want to know. I don't think I've ever heard him lie to him. I went back to my office that day. 
I had not done these 400 plus surveys at that point, but inherently I knew that I had made one of the biggest mistakes in my career up to that point. And I knew that the only person that could fix that mistake was me. Now, I might not be able to fix it with him and not repair it completely. But I remember specifically saying to myself, as I said in the office, honestly feeling a little sorry for myself. But I remember saying to myself, I'm never lying to anybody again. Certainly not professionally, not personally either, but we're talking about professional now. I'm not going to lie to people professionally. I'm just not. I'm not going to tell them what they want to hear. I'm not going to keep from telling them what they don't want to hear, if it's the truth, and I'm not going to tell them if it's not the time to tell them. But at least I can be honest and integrity based. That's 40 years ago. I kept that promise. Now, there's some people who might say it feels a little bit too abrupt, too direct. Maybe they get a little put off. But I don't think anybody can say he lied to them. What I'm here for today, tucked somewhere between insurance premiums and opioids, is the reality that you're going to see as soon as you walk out of this door and as soon as you go and make your way back to your community. You're going to find people who elected you or appointed you or hired you for a very specific purpose. It could be treasurer, it could be magistrate, it could be judge, it could be a number of other things. But they, they came to you because out of all the hundreds, even thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people in your county, they saw you willing to serve and take action on behalf of them. If you don't, it doesn't really make any difference how many years you occupy the position you're in. You have to earn their respect as a leader. And by the way, you can earn their respect in a matter of months or a relatively short period. And it doesn't take a long time as long as they know that you care, you'll listen, and you'll be honest. It's hard to be. That is a leadership challenge. Now, I told you I didn't have time to do the other four, or the other 272. And you know why. Because I don't just talk about it. I try to embrace it. And I don't want you just to think about it. I want you to do something about it as well. My dad, my dad was a construction painter. We were at best lower middle class, and at different times, even lower than that. My dad went to work. Before the kids got up and got home after dark, especially this time of year, I don't ever remember us having a conversation. I don't ever remember us having a meal without my dad being present, an evening meal. In fact, my mom would let us eat, not a bite, until my dad showed up for work and the table was set, and we would be there starving, and he'd come in, he'd wash up, and he'd plop down at the head of the table. And my mom asked him the same question virtually every time. It became a routine. I got sick of it, to be honest with you. But here's the question. Joe, how are you? To which my dad responded almost every night of his adult life, as I remember. I'm give out. I'm give out. In this room with friends, to tell people to say someone is give out, most of you understand that. If I'm in New York, as I'm going to be in a couple weeks, if I'm in Kansas, as I was last week, you know, they may not understand being give out. That's kind of a colloquial term that Kentuckians can embrace. But for those of you who may not understand it fully, give out means worse than being tired. It's being totally exhausted. It's spent. I have no reserve. I give everything I've got. Out. They didn't clean up. We'd have our supper. We'd clean up, read the paper, maybe watch a little television, go to bed before we would go to bed because he had to do all again tomorrow morning. Can anyone relate to this? I did not appreciate that nearly enough 50 plus years ago. I appreciate it now. But not just for my dad and my mom who practiced that 
as well. I appreciate it for the leaders that we choose, elect, and appoint, and lift up, who will not give up, but they will give out. They will give out. I leave you with a poem, as strange as that may sound, that says to you what I would love to say in my own words, but Dale Wimbrough, in his poem, The Man in Black, said it far better. When you get all you want in your struggle for self and the world makes you king for a day, go to the mirror and look at yourself. See what that man has to say. See, it isn't your father or mother or boss or wife whose judgment upon you must pass. The person whose verdict counts most in your life is the one staring back from the glass. Some people may think you're a straight shooting chum. They may call you a wonderful guy. But the man in the glass says, you're no more than a bum if you can't look me square in the eye. See, he's the one to please, never mind all the rest. He'll be with you clear up to the end. But you'll know that you pass life's most difficult test if that man in that glass is your friend. So remember, you can fool the whole world down this pathway of years and get pats on the back as you pass. But your final rule will be hard and complete if you cheated that man in life. My name is Philip Van Hooser. I'm a proud Kentuckian. God bless you one and all.